Okay. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Today's webinar is Lifting Community Voices, How, Af How the Afghan Mothers Action Committee Transformed One CBO's Approach to Community Engagement. This training is presented to you by Switchboard. Switchboard is a one-stop resource hub for refugee service providers in the United States. Here's a quick overview of your settings. This is a Zoom webinar, so you're joining on listening, on listening only mode. Due to the large numbers of learners on today's webinar, we've disabled the chat box. However, you do have the option to send messages to the speakers and co-facilitators via the Q&A. Keep an eye on the chat for messages from Switchboard and links to various resources we'll be mentioning throughout. Today's webinar will run for 60 minutes and is being recorded. You'll receive an email with the recording, slides, and recommended resources within 24 hours. The webinar transcripts, along with the recording, will also be posted on the Switchboard website within the following days. Lastly, we ask that you kindly complete our webinar satisfaction survey at the conclusion of our session. This short three-question survey helps us here at Switchboard continuously improve our training and technical assistance offerings to you all. And with that, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker. Nilafar Ali serves as Director of Programs at the Rupani Foundation. She leads a multilingual team of qualified early childhood development group facilitators, all of whom are additionally trained and certified as Texas DSHS Community Health Workers, CHWS, and mental health first aid providers. Her team implements client-facing pro programmatic work. They facilitate early childhood development practices for parents, and each team member provides case management, referral, and navigation support, or conducts community outreach. Troy Bush D. Donato serves as Senior Community Engagement Officer at Episcopal Health Foundation. He implements EHF's community engagement strategy through training and capacity building with community partners, grant providers, and congregations. Okay, so there is um, a poll and there are gonna be a few polls active throughout this webinar. To answer the poll questions, simply scan the QR code with a mobile device on your screen, or if you would like to go to slido.com and use the code 3271449 to participate in the poll. When you log in, you'll see the poll questions change. So the first poll question, how much experience do you have with community engagement? And with that, I'll turn over to Nilafar and Troy. Thank you so much, Kimberly. It is great to be with you guys today. And um, again, my name is Troy Bush DiDonato. I am with the Episcopal Health Foundation, and um, I'm delighted today to be able to share um, uh, what we have done in support of Rupani Foundation and the amazing work that they have done with the um, Afghani community specifically with the mothers. So looking at the polls here, it looks like we have um, a lot of varied experience within community engagement. Um, the majority are kind of right smack dab in the middle, not exactly experts, not exactly um, novice. So um, it's great to have all of you and we hope that we can share um, some information that will make you guys um, more effective out in your community. All right, let's um, move on to the next slide, please. So we've got a couple objectives today. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to um, share some elements and strategies that will help you um, implement a successful community engagement plan. Go ahead. Go ahead to the next. All right, so we're going to start with kind of a definition. What is community engagement? This is a um, piece of the definition that CDC uses, um, and we believe that it is the most um, appropriate of definitions in terms of um, how we think about community engagement, um, specifically around health and healthcare. 
Um, what I want to point out here is that we are working um, collaboratively with and through um, those that we are most likely wanting to be of service to. Go ahead to the next slide. So why is community engagement um, important? Um, there's lots of reasons to, um, uh, to say that engagement is, is important, but really for us, um, it, is, it is the way that we are able to create true and authentic relationships with those that we're trying to be of service to. And it moves us away from really transactional um, approaches of, of, of work and moves us into, again, really um, places where there is shared understanding, expertise, and leadership. Go ahead to the next slide. So here's our next active poll. Which example might um, be the most effective way to foster community engagement? And again, we're going to give you guys a few minutes to click into that poll and give us your answers. And while you're answering, I'm just going to check in on the poll to make sure that we can see everyone who is answering the slides. Thank you, Kim. Troy, if it's okay with you, is it all right if we come back to this one? I see that it's sure. answerable, but I'm not sure why it's not showing up on the screen. No worries. We will come back to that. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, one more. So again, we think about um, and have uh, spent a lot of time thinking around how it is best for us to present community engagement. And again, we have borrowed from the CDC, which they actually borrowed from the International Association of Public Participation, and it's their continuum of community engagement. This is not a what a, a uh, a six-step process to doing really good community engagement. Um, if we had that, everybody would be doing it. Um, instead, what we do is we use these levels of engagement as um, markers um, for um, where we'd like to be um, and the things that we want to promise to the community and, and, and how we want to be in relationship with them and the activities then that we um, are, are using to engage the community. There are five levels. Again, there's outreach, consult, involve, collaborate, and shared leadership. What I want to tell you is that there is no wrong level of engagement. Any level of engagement that you are doing, as long as the activities and what you are saying to the community are in alignment, you're probably doing good work. What I will also tell you, though, is that as you move across the continuum, um, two things are going to happen. One, you will be working with less and less actual um, residents. Um, and two, um, however, you will be more impactful. Um, the, as you move across the continuum towards collaboration and shared leadership, you are really doing more transformational work. And, um, and again, probably dealing with less people um, in general, but making more impactful um, uh, engagement. All right, let's go to the next slide. So what are the goals of each of these um, levels? Well, outreach is something that we probably all of you do without even thinking about it. It's our websites, it's our elevator speech, it is our newsletters to all of our different constituents. It is all of the ways that we talk about ourselves and that we're providing information on who we are um, and, and what we know about the community, if anything. As we move across the continuum, the level of consult is starting to ask questions of those that we are wanting to be of service to. What's working well? What's not working well? What would you need to be better at X, Y, and Z? 
um, oftentimes for us, it is what makes, um, what would help you make a, a more healthy community. Um, and oftentimes this is kind of where we see um, our, our grantees and, and a lot of our community partners kind of stop that engagement. But if we move a continuum across the continuum to the level of involved, we're really going back into the community and saying, this is what we heard and now help us understand what it is that we could do with you um, to, to um, address some of what we were able to learn. When we get to that level of collaboration, again, it is just one more step further where we're starting to say, okay, here's what we've decided needs to happen. We want to partner with you and other organizations to make this happen. And then finally, shared leadership really is a, looks a little bit more like an outcome because it is putting the decision-making um, abilities within the community and with the partners um, so that everybody has a say in what's happening. Let's go on to the next slide. And I'm going to turn it over here to Neela Four, who is going to explain um, some of what Rupani has done um, uh, after the uh, capacity building that we supported them with in community engagement. Neela Four. Thank you so much, Troy. So um, can you move to the next slide, please? Yes. So um, we, together with um, uh, Troy, uh, when we we done our, our first uh, training for of uh, community uh, development, we started uh, this Mother Action Committee uh, with the Pani Foundation. The Pani Foundation's Mother Action Committee is typically a group of mothers who come together to address specific issues or concerns related to their community, their children, and families. These committees play very important role in educating for change, promoting social initiatives, and creating uh, a supportive network for mothers and families. This specific role and activities of this Mother's Action Committee is widely based on what we decided for. And uh, that there is like Mother Action Committees, they are, very, they are responsible for advocacy and awareness. Mother Action Committee is uh, like really educate for the policies and change that benefit children and families. There is awareness about issues such as, such as education, healthcare, child welfare, and uh, women's rights and work to get towards the policy reforms and uh, or improve services in the, in the areas. And then these committees often provide a space for mothers to connect, share their experiences and support each other. So this is a very, very beautiful model where they can share their own stories, they can help each other, so they can offer emotional support, uh, advices to each other, and resources to navigate challenges related to parenting, their family life, and community engagement. So this Mother Action Committee help us organize workshops and training sessions to empower mothers with knowledge and skills. This includes parenting, educational, financial literacy, mental health, health and nutrition information and other topics relevant to their family well-being. And then they play a very important role in developing the community, like the community takes on projects that contributes to community development, such as organizing neighborhood cleanups, creating play spaces for their children. They come up with different uh, ideas where they can, uh, they can be in charge of their kids' play outside uh, the community, inside the community. So they are initiating a lot of wonderful models within the community. And then um, they spread ahead initiatives that are pressing social issues such as promoting gender equality, advocating for children's rights, also supporting vulnerable populations within the community. And then uh, these committees often serve as a platform for sharing information about available resources, services, and opportunities for mothers and families. Like they connect all the newcomers, and they they usually come up uh, with the uh, different ideas. They connect those new families who are here uh, with the Pani Foundation, and then they inform us that they are uh, we have some families here, and their role is really really very important and crucial. And then they uh, organize campaigns and projects. Uh, projects to address specific challenges such as improving men maternal mental health, raising awareness about education access, and combating those uh, social issues like substance substance abuse. Like they are now in charge of their uh, 
children's uh, protection, like child protection is very important for them now. And all of this Mother Action Committee plays a very, very crucial role in creating positive change and improving the lives of families and children within their communities. And by harnessing this collective power of mothers and their shared concerns, these committees contribute to building stronger mothers and resilient communities. So this this model is very very successful with us at Rupani Foundation and now they are like very very uh, empowered leaders in the community can you uh, move the slide yes so um like before starting the community engagement effort what we did was while implementing this program or initiative that involved community engage engagement Several key steps were taken, uh, like, for example, we uh, we did a lot of town hall meetings with this community, with the orientation of the program, along with some gift bag distribution, and then step that the first step was like, to develop a thorough understanding of the community, its culture, history, demographics, and existing assets. So uh, this was achieved through surveys, interviews with community members and collaborating with local organizations who are already working with them. And we uh, we had a lot of meetings with them. And then we went to the uh, leasing office and we asked that what are the challenges and what they are experiencing so far. And we also include uh, the school, the connected school with the uh, those, those apartments where we came to know that what issues are they facing in the school regarding the, the kids, regarding the mothers and uh, everything. So we identified stakeholders, recognized the engage and engage with key stakeholders within the community, uh, like as I said, that the school, the activists, the local leaders, and representatives from various groups and demographics. Rather than imposing solutions from outside, our uh, our approach is like we adopted a participatory uh, approach that involves active listening to the community members, conducted focus group community meetings, interviews and gather insight in understanding the community's priorities and their needs. And then uh, like approaching to the community is a, you know, is a, in a respectful and inclusive and collaborative manner helps create a sense of ownership and buy-in for the community members, leading to more effective and sustainable outcomes for uh, these initiatives. So uh, Rupani Foundation really believes uh, that we should uh, really bring the community in for all those decisions, whatever decisions we are making. If the community is part of the decision making, then a success is yours. So next slide, please. Yes, so our model is like uh, how, how we can be successful in the community as like we contact with them, we made a commitment, we take the permission, we build trust, and we include all those leaders and we build strong relationship, like in, in, initiate communication and outreach to community members and leaders, introduce the engagement initiatives, it goals, its goals and the benefits of participation is very important for us. And demonstrating uh, transparency in your intentions, like actions and communication, share information honestly and openly that what are you going to do and why are you here? That really create a lot of trust within the community. And then I respectfully request communities, community members' permission to involve them in the engagement process, explain what participation entails, and ensure they feel comfortable in, in contributing uh, with you. That's very important. And then uh, you have to show the commitment, emphasize the value of community members' participation and input, encourage their commitment to actively engage and share their insight, insights. So that's how you can uh, you can make a very strong commitment from them and uh, towards them. So uh, the, the collaborate with the community leaders to help spread the word, encourage participation, and amplify the voices of different segments of the community is very important. So those leaders can be wonderful leaders for the future, not for only your organization, but for you are creating wonderful citizens here. And then uh, throughout the engagement process, we really focus on building the uh, nurturing relationship with the community members like we show that you are uh, very important to us and then show that that uh, you are actively listening to them and acknowledge their perspectives, their views, their ideas, and include them into your program. That's very important. So now I will um, 
I request try to take the next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Neela, for um, so much there. You guys have done such an amazing amount of work with the uh, with the Afghan community and, and specifically the mothers. And, and again, I'm not a huge fan of the word empowerment, um, but you guys have really empowered those women to, um, to come to the table and be not only advocates for themselves, but for their children. And it, it's such a, an amazing amount of work that you guys have done. So we wanna talk just a little bit about some of the strategies that you would use and could use within um, each of these levels. And again, this is not an exhaustive list, um, but we kind of wanted to share with you um, some of the things that you could be doing. So again, in the outreach, it's things that we probably are already doing. It's our websites, it's our newsletters, um, looking at how we're getting information out and, um, and letting people know who we are and what we're doing. Moving to that level of consulting, um, simple surveys, uh, public meetings. Um, uh, Nilifer talked about some of the town halls that they did um, where they were starting to kind of really listen to um, the community. Um, moving into that level of consulting, or I'm sorry, to the level of involving, um, looking at taking some of that information that you heard from um, the, the level of consult and doing some workshopping, doing some deeper dives into what does that mean for the community. Um, oftentimes what's being said is there, you know, there are some hidden messages there. So I'm sure that you are um, really mindful of some of that. Um, as we move to that level of, of collaboration, um, building that participation um, to where there is some true um, uh, consensus and everyone is starting to not necessarily say I'm 100% behind this, but I'm not going to do anything to um, to uh, burn it down and to stop the progress. Um, and again, making sure that everyone that is um, at the table actually has a, a vote and a say. Um, and then again, at that level of shared leadership, um, uh, at its largest level, we would start to see um, ballots and, and delegated decision-making. Um, that's really more at a city county level, at an organizational level, it really is taking those committees that you have formed and making sure that everybody has an opportunity um, to participate in what is um, what has happening and what is not. Let's go on to the next slide. So one of the most important things to remember is that um, you are, you're, you and your organization are probably not the first folks to arrive in the community and want to be of service. So keep in mind um, that um, that there is history within these communities that you need to be mindful of. Not only their, their um, history as a community, but the history of those that have come before you to try to be of service. There are some certain things that you can do to really um, uh, build trust and rapport like um, the key elements that Nilafar talked about. Some of those are just being respectful of, of those that you're trying to be of service to. Lots of communities don't um, really want to be photographed. They don't want to be recorded. So be be thoughtful about that kind of thing. Um, also, being respectful of of um, who it is that you are in terms of um, how you show up in the community. So for me, being a white male, um, to try to go in and work in the Afghan um, mothers community, um, I would be a strange man, and that would culturally not be appropriate. And so being mindful of who you are before you show up and, and learning how to use proxies and people that are more appropriate um, to do that work on your behalf. And then lastly, just showing up. Show up at, at other events. Show up at, at religious um, um, uh, churches and, and um, temples and, and just be a part of um, the community. It goes a long way in showing that you are there for more than just the work that you are doing. Um, and, and whenever possible, um, if possible, use their language and, um, and learn their language. And again, their customs and, and, um, and the things that are most important to them. Let's go on to the next slide. I think we have a poll. Did we get our polls um, figured out, Kimberly? Yep, this one is all good. Fantastic. All right. So what is the most important strategy to implement before launching a community program? Can you, 
give you guys a minute or two to um, get into Slido and share your responses. All right, this is looking really good. And this is exactly what we would want to see. Absolutely. While all of these things are important to do, um, doing your research and trying to the best of your ability to kind of understand the community really is important and is, um, is going to do a, a lot of um, work for you before you even get to the community. Um, all right, let's move on to the next slide. I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for Q&A. So again, um, transparency is, is absolutely key. Um, be respectful of those that you are trying to be of service to. Um, learn what it is like um, to, uh, to be in that community. You are probably not part of that community. And so it goes a long way to, um, to go in and say, help me understand what it's like to be a part of this community. Um, don't assume that you know um, already. Being mindful that you are working with and through, again, um, to, with those that you're trying to be of service to. And, and lastly, this is not something that you can do in a month. This is not something that you can do in, in six months. Um, there is, it is going to take a long time to build this trust and rapport um, and to really see um, the needle move and, and change happen. So be mindful that this is a long-term commitment. All right, let's go on. I think we've got another. Um, so this is a little bit more of a um, kind of an open-ended place for you. So what are the things that you are finding most challenging in terms of um, community engagement? Again, we're gonna give you guys just a minute to um, get into Slido and respond. All right, so I'm seeing one um, response already around language barriers, and um, this is absolutely um, uh, a challenge for lots of us. Um, I will tell you, um, one of the things that we think most about is um, partnering as close to the um, ground level as possible and bringing to the surface some of those community-based organizations that, um, like Rupani, that have um, folks that can actually speak the language and um, and be true partners out in the community. Um, motivating recipients of um, services, um, motivation and incentive is, um, is important. Um, keep in mind that when you are trying to meet with folks um, that you want to make sure that you are meeting with them and motivating them to, um, to come and participate, so you want to make sure that that is happening at a, at a time that is most useful for them. Neela Fort, are you seeing any of these um, comments that you want to chime in on? I really, I really like the cultural competency one, and that's really, really important to be in the community. If you are uh, really culturally sensitive to, towards them, then you can make a lot of difference in the community. So yeah, there, the, all the responses are wonderful. Yeah, I agree. The the um. I'm also seeing one here around managing client expectations. And again, I think that's where that level of transparency is really important. Being mindful that you are not going to, as an organization, be able to um, solve the world's problems, right? So be, be clear and open about what it is that you can and cannot do 
from the beginning. Um, and, and again, this is where partnering with other organizations is critical because not every organization is going to be able to answer all of the concerns of, of the community. So the more partners that you have at the table, the more likely you're going to be able to, to resource some of those concerns. All right, let's move on. So we want you to now think about a time when, um, where you did community engagement um, work and it was tra uh, transformational. And, and what made that effective? What were the things that happened there that were really helpful in, in creating transformational engagement work? We can give you a, a couple minutes to think about that. Active this listening. good one. Yeah, mm -hmm. active listening is super important. And we as um, as a society are not really good at listening. Um, and exactly. the, the things that we say to folks all the time is um, you're already um, answering the questions before you really even know what the questions are. So active listening is, is super important. Non-judgmental is a good one. Like uh, is, is organizations, whenever we go to the community, we are like, starting saying things without thinking and without being sensitive about their culture that's very important absolutely yes mm -hmm. i love listening to understand um mm -hmm. perfect being flexible and adaptable you are I don't, i'm not sure who anonymous is but you're absolutely right um again best laid plans they you know they hit the ground sometimes and we have to completely rearrange and so being mindful that um, there's always going to be opportunities to um, to adapt. And, um, and again, that goes a long way in allowing for the community to understand that you are listening, you are paying attention. This is a good one. Culturally responsive and truly inclusive act of listening and collaborating. Yeah, that's very important. Like uh, for us, even at Rupani Foundation, we always try to include all of them and listen to them and being responsive. And understanding the culture is really, really important. These are excellent. Um, I love this this idea mm -hmm. of um, small group discussions. And, and yes, I think um, oftentimes we are um, bringing as many people in together as possible. And in organizing, a lot of times we do these small house groups that um, kind of focus on smaller populations and people that are already really more comfortable having conversations amongst themselves. And those go a long way, again, in really listening in a deeper way um, than you would if you were bringing everybody together in one large um, auditorium or um, uh, opportunity like that. Um, I agree. Agreed. And following up is a good one too. So I saw previously also uh, because most of the time when we are really busy, we don't follow up. So it's very really important to follow up with the clients, uh, what they are doing, how they are doing, and what they are going through. So it's really good one. Absolutely. Um, if you say you're going to do it, do it and do it in a timely mm -hmm. manner. And if you can't do it for any reason, be be honest about that and share that back with the community. Um, one failed opportunity um, really will go, it will set you back tremendously. These are great responses. Um, I wish we had more time to discuss all of them, but I think we need to move on because I think we have some Q&A time. So before we get to the Q&A, the um, uh, Switchboard has shared some resources for you guys. Um, these are great toolkits and, um, and ways of um, getting your hands on some really practical um, ways to apply some of what we talked about today. So I encourage you to go back in and um, dig into some of these resources. Let's go on to the next slide. All right, so I think, I hope we have been able to um, share our learning objectives. We have shared some elements and some strategies, and now we want to kind of hear from you guys. Um, let's move on and get to the Q&A, and we're going to ask Dominic 
uh, Verino to join us, and he is going to uh, moderate our Q&A session. And so, Dominic, I'll turn it over to you. Wow, what a great presentation. Thank you so much, Troy and Nilofer. Uh, so much information was shared, I think, uh, you know, with in the Afghan communities, uh, you know, we can do a lot. And I think what the services that you're all providing is is crucial to, to the growth within the community. Um, and at this time, I'd like uh, anyone from the audience to go ahead and write your question in the Q&A box, and, and we'll go ahead and direct those to Troy and Nilafer. Uh, let me see if we can get some to come in. And uh, in the meantime, what I was curious about is um, maybe one of you or both of you can share an example of uh, community engagement that you've experienced in, in your careers that has made an impact in your life. Neither for a Troy, can, can you share like a, a little story perhaps? And yes, what, uh, what, I, I will go first. The drive I can, to continue to do that? Yes, I can share one. So like, uh, for example, with Afghan mothers, we created this uh, mother action committee and uh, we have a lot of mother action committees wherever we go in the community, in apartment complexes, we create one mother action committee. This committee consists of eight um, mothers and that's the minimum uh, number, but we can go beyond to 10, 15. But uh, whenever we uh, start this committee, it's like uh, initially that the, all the mothers are like very timid. They are not open to share anything after the training processes and after the uh, their sessions with them. So one of our success story, which really made that impact is like um, a mother from uh, Mother's Action Committee is really grown and she is like, she's wonderful. She's doing great in the community and Pani Foundation has hired her. So uh, that's, that's a very a big uh, thing for me and a success story for all of us. So she was initially, she was not very open to come uh, to the Mother Action Committee and she, she was not very open, but by the time, uh, uh, we, she attended all those sessions and now she's part of Pani Foundation. There's a big achievement for me and there's uh, it, it makes a lot of impact. Wow, that's amazing. So she is actually employed by Pani Foundation and, and creating an income, a, a stable income for her and her family. That's true. That's true. That's what so a wonderful cool. story. So I also wanted to ask you, uh, Nina, first, approaching the community, um, how are you gaining the trust within the community that you're providing a service that is going to be helpful to them and their families? What do you, what's the convey tactics that you use uh, in the field with you and your team uh, to, to, you know, kind of gain their trust and, and have them open the doors to, to what Rapani Foundation is, is uh, uh, servicing for them? So wonderful question, Dominic. Uh, so uh, I would definitely say knowledge about the community history and perce uh, perception of those initiating engagements will make it easier to initiate engagement and sustain it. And absolutely, having a deep understanding of the community history, their perceptions of the individuals or, and organizations initiating the engagement is crucial for success and sustained community engagement. So that's why we, we really respect of whatever their culture is. And understanding community's history helps you res uh, really respect its culture, social and historical context. This demonstrates your commitment to acknowledge, acknowledging and valuing the community's past experience and contribution. So that's one thing I would definitely say. And then second, when you show that you are uh, knowledgeable about the community history, you build credibility and trust. This can lead to more positive perception of your intentions and motivation. So uh, also uh, like learning from other organizations, whatever uh, their failures, it's very important. So whatever they applied and if it didn't work, you have to learn from those experiences too. So we also try to learn from other organizations too. There's again, a very strong thing to build trust. And then uh, we are not repeating the same mistakes and we are not like uh, repeating whatever others uh, have done in the field. And then on knowledge of the community's history allow you to tailor your engagement strategies to resonate with their experiences and values. This customization increases the relevance and effectiveness of your effort. And building rapport, that's very important. When you build the relationship with them, then they, they start trusting you and then you they allow you to the community and 
the one more important thing which I always think is like be like them. Don't uh, don't show them that you are different and they are different. Be respectful. And what we do at the Pani Foundation is like whenever we go to the community, we even dress like them. So that's very important. So then they welcome you, they respect you, and they trust you. That's great. So culturally appropriate attire when you when you're within the community is is uh, a form of of the welcoming committee essentially. So that actually goes right into um, this first question I from uh, Elena. Because seeing progress is slow, how can we keep client engagement and interest from decreasing? So how could you prolong the interest? Uh, if you've seen uh, your work in the community, uh, you know, maybe dwindle down, how do you kind of ramp back up and, and get them involved again and excited about what's coming up? Or what are some things that you're using uh, to keep their engagement high? So most of the time, uh, try you, you would like to go? No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead, Neil. <laughs> Okay, so what uh, what we trying to do in the community is we really include the community in decision making, mm -hmm. and what they want from us, what are their needs, and what uh, what they want to learn, and so what are the pressing issues in the community. So we really focus on those things, and we come up with the different sessions and activities for them, and then all the activities we are designing, they are very innovative where they can um, participate really well. To keep their morale high and keep their participation high, it's very important to create uh, all the activities innovatively. For example, I will share one example. So we did uh, this mental health se session, series of mental health sessions for uh, these Afghan mothers, but we never named them mental health sessions. We said that uh, we are um, we are doing uh, sister talks or whatever you name them. Just just name them differently. Don't say that uh, we we never said that this is a mental health group. And then we did a series of those uh, those groups. And what we did is we uh, we did our storytelling method. And then uh, we started with ourselves. I share my story. Our uh, expert shared her story. So then they started opening up. They shared their own stories with us. And then uh, after concluding uh, all these series of those sessions, we uh, created a very good ambience for them where we uh, we uh, uh, invited and we outsource uh, henna artists for them and then we applied that henna into their hands and then we said this is the this is the this is the event for you where you can share your happiness where you can share your uh, sadness with your sisters uh, and with this group so we created the whole environment in the clubhouse where they they sit down they sing songs and they share their stories, they select their power word. Whenever uh, they share their story, we ask them to select a power word for themselves. And they selected the power word. And then we uh, really um, painted that power word on their hand with henna. And they were sharing their stories. They, they loved the experience. And this is how we create uh, innovative ideas. And then those sessions are not like a random and simple sessions where we can we collect them or then ask them to sit on the chairs. But we come up with different ideas where they can enjoy the sessions and then learn a lot from those uh, sessions. So, Neela, for that, that's great idea. So, you spoke on um, not calling it mental health sessions. Is there a reason why you would rename it? Yes, de definitely. Whenever you say mental health, so it's a, you know, in, in these cultures, uh, it's a table. It's not acceptable. This, these words are not acceptable for them. And then whenever you say these words, they, they will not come to your sessions. And then they say that we are not uh, normally, that, like we are not crazy or words like that. We are fine. We are doing well. So like all of us are going through something, but we need to really uh, do our catharsis. We should share our stories. We should, we should share our thinking. And this is very important for all of us. So, uh, but whenever you say it's mental health session, uh, they will not come to you. So we, you have to come up with the ideas, different ideas where they, you can bring them to those sessions and then without naming the, those things, you can you can create a success model. I think that right. goes with lots of communities, um, language matters, right? Um, and uh, we've seen in lots of instances where um, we've wanted to support uh, um, parenting skills and um, and that's 
uh, something that people don't necessarily want to sign up for because they don't want to admit that they don't know how to parent well. And so, for instance, we had a, um, a group that was wanting specifically to engage um, men and, and fathers. And instead of calling it parenting skills or um, how to be a good dad, they did um, barbecuing contests um, because men love to burn meat. And that got everybody engaged. And then they were able to, while people were enjoying a meal, um, have some content around um, parenting and um, and those men stayed very much engaged. So um, language does matter, but your activities matter as well. That's a great point, Troy. I'm I'm really happy to hear that story, um, which is going to actually lead us into the next question from our attendees uh, from Mina. How can we make a men group successfully uh, special in an Afghan community? How can we encourage them to participate in our sessions actively? with all the family's responsibilities they, that they have. And I think you made a great point and you basically answered that question, but maybe there's some other examples that we can throw out and, and, and show that the men can, can actively participate and, and engage with them. Yeah, I think you have to give um, uh, lots of time and effort into being um, as, as appropriate for them as possible. So, you know, meeting at at two o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday is not going to work, right? Most of these men are working. Uh, many of them are working multiple jobs. So really doing your homework and finding out when is when is the most appropriate time to get um, men um, engaged and then thinking about, again, like what are the things that they are, would enjoy so that you are bringing them to the table to do more than just your work? Um, I think that's an important. Um, I want to go back, um, uh, Dominic, there was a question about um, engaging um, uh, around some sensitive issues. And um, one of the things that we very much encourage is, is using art and theater um, as ways of engaging communities in conversations that are difficult to discuss, that they're not necessarily going to sit around and say, here's what's going on, right? Um, but using art, um, using um, theater, um, uh, letting the community um, write and do skits um, that kind of explain and, and implicitly kind of demonstrate what's happening in a way that then you can start to build some dialogue around that. That's a really good uh, engagement activity, I think, uh, to to approach those um, you know questions or or issues that maybe someone or in the community might be having uh, to express themselves in a way that there's there's no uh, uh, stigma or or uh, you know someone is looking differently at someone else because of their 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 passions. Um, I think. You know, that actually was uh, the question that we were kind of go back up to, Troy, and I appreciate you chiming in and, and kind of directing it toward that. The other thing I wanted to talk to talk to both of you about is, um, you know, have you seen or have you had experiences in the community that have uh, impacted the, the fathers in these families in a way that they've taken on responsibility and, and come out to um, these engagements or participated in classes that, that you may offer? Nina, do you have anything like that at, at, with the uh, Refining Foundation? Definitely, um, Dominic, this is, uh, this is a good question. So usually uh, we all know that bringing fathers to the sessions and to uh, these uh, community engagements is always difficult because they these communities are they, uh, usually mothers are not working, but fathers are regularly working. So um, we, we did one uh, youth leadership session where uh, we were just wanted to uh, learn that what are their needs and what they are uh, thinking and how we can uh, link them with the right resources out there. So out of that youth leadership group, we uh, a lot of requests came that you should train uh, those uh, fathers and then uh, male uh, dominating member of the uh, family. Uh, and then they said that you need to do that too. And then we are out of that feedback, we uh, started creating. Uh, father's leadership groups. So we named them father leadership groups and we were able to bring uh, those fathers to our sessions. And again, we did uh, the mental health sessions for them. 
but we never named them mental health sessions. As I previously mentioned, uh, we uh, started discussing all those uh, pressing issues, all those taboos and how we can solve uh, these issues with those fathers. And then initially they were reluctant to come. Our first group was uh, like, we hardly get to, um, we were able to get seven fathers. And then gradually by the time we were able to create a huge group uh, in the community. And now those all those father leadership groups are playing a vital part in our uh, all uh, initiatives, whatever we are doing there. All those fathers are involved. They're sending their wives to the center. Initially, they were like, uh, why, where are you going? What are you doing? And all these questions. But once uh, you we involve them with our sessions, now they know who Rupani Foundation is, what they are doing, what is their um, agenda, and how they are uh, how how they perceive the community development. They know everything, and then they are part of our um, a lot of our initiatives. They are uh, our leadership groups. So whenever we need anything, we just contact them, like Mother's Action Committee. Uh, we have uh, men's leadership groups too. So uh, they uh, they help us uh, to bring all those newcomers, whoever uh, is just uh, reached to uh, this uh, country, they link those people to us. And, and the beautiful thing is we create a huge WhatsApp group where all those fathers, all those mothers are uh, included. And whenever we have any resource, any training, any uh, new thing, any training, we just post it in there and then they disseminate all the information to everybody. And then gradually we started this group with 30 people and now we are in hundreds. So we are helping this way. And whenever we find any resource, all those fathers are uh, calling us. They are part of our uh, all, all the activities we are doing in the community. And they are very active. They are sending their kids to um, the center, Rupani Foundation Early Childhood Education classes. Uh, our... ESL classes. And then one thing I would like to mention that before the, these mothers were not uh, really uh, ready and uh, allowed to go out, out of those apartment complexes, but we created a very wonderful model where uh, Houston Public Library and the school in, right in front of the uh, these apartment complexes, we created a ESL program where these mothers attend this, the school, saw the school first time in their life. So they were amazed to see the environment. Initially, they were very, very uh, scared, very reluctant to go inside uh, the school. And then we were able to take them to the school. The school principal graciously uh, gave us one classroom where we started those ESL programs. And these fathers help us to take those mothers to the uh, school. And then now the school principal's feedback is like before, these mothers are not uh, very regular and they are not send, They were not sending their kids to school regularly. Attendance ratio was so low. Uh, after these sessions, these ESL classes, they saw the school environment. They saw what their kids are doing there. They saw the importance of education. And then they themselves sit in the classroom learning early childhood education, learning ESL uh, programs there. Now they know the importance and they are sending their kids to the school regularly. And they also go for uh, all those parent-teacher uh, meetings. They go to ask their, about their kids' uh, progress. And, uh, and then now it's, it's completely changed. So they are now responsible and in charge of their kids' education and their kids' well-being. That's a, that's a really great point, Nilifer. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so really what you're doing is, is you're gaining their, their, their trust to let them into your home, and then you're actually bringing them out into the community and bringing them into their children's schools and having them get acclimated to those situations. And that really creates a sense of, of independence for them. Um, that, that's wonderful. I'd love to hear that. So I wanted to, to ask you... Sorry, I wanted to ahead, sorry, try. real quick and say, I, I think one of the key elements there is that that work started um, close to their home, right? Not in your office, not in an organizational setting. It was within yes. their home. And I think that's really critical going back to, to engaging the men. Um, think about um, starting slow. Like Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Find those champions, find those men that have... Um, not necessarily responsibility or or authority of any way, but are influential, right? That have some um, influence within the community. Um, if you can engage those men, um, then some of the others will follow. 
Um, finding those kind of community champions are really critical to, to making some of this work um, uh, happen quickly. Great, I think we have time for one more. And this is actually a, a, not a question, but it's a, it's a comment. Um, an example I have found of successful community engagement is the time when I referred a newly arrived refugee youth to his community by contacting their community leader, who I routinely call. Uh, the following week, I attended their Eid al filter, filter at the invitation of their letter, leader. I could tell my client was positively impacted by my attendance, uh, as we, the other members of the community, uh, especially considering I attended uh, on the weekend, that's you know, that's something that's really impactful to see the community uh, involvement as, as us, you know, the people that are working in in these nonprofits and and providing services to attend these events, these uh, you know special occasions uh, for the community. And so maybe uh, is that something that that is constantly um appreciated uh within the community to see you or, or your team or troy and, and your staff in, in the field with them during these uh you know holidays and com communal events yeah, absolutely and again um we talked earlier about you know showing up showing up means a lot to the community if you're asking them to come and participate you need to show up and participate as well so finding out what it is that is important to them and being a part of that to the best of your ability um, showing up after hours and on weekends goes a long way to show um, that you really are um, uh, being mindful of, of the community that they live in and you want to be a part of the solution. Um, again, it's kind of a scratching your back, I'll scratch mine kind of situation. You've got to show up. And it's hard, I think, sometimes for a lot of our leaders of our organizations to understand, well, so what are you doing there? And I oftentimes have to say, I'm just gonna be there. And that is is all I can do, but it goes a long way in, in um, building that trust in the, in the relationship. It's Wonderful. True. Thank you so much, uh, Troy and Jennifer, for all your in, inputs uh, and answering the most of the questions that we had. Uh, we can keep talking about this, I'm sure, all day. Uh, but at this time, I, I'd like to thank you both for, for your, your time and your wealth of knowledge and your experience. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Kimberly at this time. Thank you both. All right. Thank you all for a great webinar and great information. So um, that concludes the webinar. But before, um, before you leave, we would really appreciate your help. So help us help you. Um, if you would be so kind as to scan the QR code or... Um, there would be a link in the chat, but scan the QR code to take a three um, question survey. It's very short and it just helps us improve our training and technical assistance. So I'm going to leave this up for a, a little bit. And then following this webinar within 24 hours, you'll get the resources, the replay links, and then some of the other things that we have accompanying this presentation. And here are some of the references that will be included in the slide deck that we'll share with you. And as always, stay connected with Switchboard for more training and technical assistance. Um, you can email us at switchboard at rescue.org or visit us at www.switchboardta.org and also follow us on social media at switchboardta. On behalf of all of us at Switchboard, thank you for learning with us and we'll hope to see you again soon. And thank you um, to our speakers from Rupani, um, Nilafar, um, and also Troy and also Dominic, really appreciate you taking the time to, um, to present to, with us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you.